you needed to have five minutes of listening in each quarter hour. And so radio stations would run commercials at 10, 20, 40, and 50. And we were having people write down when they listened. And we knew that nobody listened accurately. And so we would lie about the time on the air. And and you would try to get that five minutes in each of those quarter hours. And so you would fib about what time it was. So back to what I was saying. What's up, what's up, what's up, friends, family, and fans? It is I, Stone Stafford, and welcome to Life. This is where we listen and inspire friends in entertainment. And everywhere. That's right, because life happens to everyone. I am here with my ride or die, as you already know, Mr. Johnny Vaughn. Johnny Vaughn. And today we are honored to have the legendary Mr. Mike McVeigh. Hello, sir. Hello, hello, hello. I appreciate you guys inviting me. I'm very honored. Shoot, we're the one that are honored. And where are you joining us from today? I am in a little town west of Cleveland, Ohio, called Avon Lake. Avon Lake. Oh, yeah. Never heard of it. Yeah, right. Yeah, no. <laughs> you, had, you had me in Cleveland, Mike. Yeah, but Lake sounds beautiful, man. So welcome. Welcome uh, for joining us here. I'm going to have Johnny kind of give a little introduction to who you are and then allow you to expand on your experience. No, I'm not going to do that. Stuff. I'm going to let Mr. McVeigh tell everybody who he is because I will sit here and turn into a fanboy. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, he's, he's, he's deserving of it. But um, so, yeah, so please tell the listeners exactly who you are. I really need them to understand who we have on today. So let, you know, throw modesty out the window if you can. And uh, go ahead and toot your horn, sir. So longtime uh, radio guy whose career evolved into all things audio. Um, actually started out on the air myself in my hometown of Pittsburgh, PA, many, many years ago. Became a program director and worked in radio stations in small markets like Wheeling, West Virginia, and big markets like Los Angeles, uh, was a general manager, owned some radio stations along the way, uh, moved to Atlanta in September 2011 to oversee programming for Cumulus Media, which is the uh, third largest now, used to be second largest radio group in America. Uh, Part of that job was overseeing content with Westwood One Radio Network and the Podcast Network. Uh, Did that until mid-2019. Relaunched McVeigh Media, a longtime consulting firm. Uh, McVeigh Media has been around now for about 32 years off and on. Uh, At one point, we consulted about 200 radio stations. And today, it's a small company. It's me, my wife, both of my kids, and a son-in-law. And uh, we are, you know, focused on everything around radio and in all the ancillary businesses like podcasting, creating syndicated and network shows. I consult a digital company. I consult an experiential marketing company. I coach talent and I do a lot of things around media, speak at events and what have you. So it's kind of who I am. I've been around a long time, as uh, you can tell from my gray hair. (laughs) So you are Mr. Radio. I don't think that's too far fetched. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I want to ask you this to get us out of the gate because you've you've seen my entire career within you know a third of yours. Uh, I think maybe me is thirty years old. I'm coming up on fifteen years in the industry. Uh, when I came in in 2008, it was right around that time where things were. I'm going to say starting to not be as fun. The digital world was starting to really take over. We were starting to see the slip in, in revenue because streaming was starting to become a, an inkling of a thing. Um, hit me with a little bit of what you remember of the good old days and how you've watched it evolve into what it is now. And what do you potentially see it turning into with some of the new technologies that we're seeing introduced? Well, and, and I should preface this by saying I am one of those people who think the good old days are now, whatever period that is I'm in, Mm -hmm. um, which is why I've been able to evolve and grow over the years. Um, I know that a lot of broadcasters, when I talk to them, the good old days were, you know, before HR, to be honest, uh, where they could have more fun, be a little crazy, um, you know, party more. Um, You know, mom and pop radio 
was big until consolidation started in 95. And your point, it was really a rush through about 2008 uh, with consolidation. Um, consolidation eliminated a lot of people's jobs and mom and pop sold to different companies. That meant multitasking for people, lower pay in some cases, in some cases, greater pay, more money. Um, you know, the difference would be, I mean, I wrote an article, I write for Radio Inc. online, they're daily. The, um, you know, the good old days, you know, to me, were probably before, you know, attorneys. Uh, I wrote recently in, in a Radio Inc. article, I blame the lawyers. And it was, it was those days when you could broadcast on a billboard and say, I'm going to stay up here until the Atlanta Falcons win a game. Or yeah. those days when you could jump out of an airplane and do a stunt. But, you know, attorneys doing their job means you need to be risk adverse. And so that changed a lot of the things that are out there. And I'm not going to say it changed them for the worse, honestly. Um, it just changed them. Um, I think that the folks that talk about the good old days probably had more freedom on air, more freedom as a creative um, if you were a program director, uh, might have been less pressure. If you were a market manager, less, less pressure. An example I would give you is that I was a program director in Los Angeles at 24 years old. Today, I don't know that anybody would do that. I mean, in those days, the company I worked for was allowed to own seven FMs and seven AMs and no more than one AM and one FM in a market. The business wasn't where it is today. The value of those radio stations was significantly less than it is today. And so I don't think today anybody would give a 24 year old that chance in a Los Angeles. So I don't know if that answers your question about. What no, it absolutely does. I can, I can actually confirm that no one will give a 24 year old that shot in Market 34 in Orlando or in Atlanta either, because I, I was that 24 year old who thought I deserved that shot at one point and did not get it. Now, as a consumer, though, because I'm always I'm going to speak. I, I wasn't in radio, so I'm going to speak strictly from a consumer side. Sure. One, just for listeners who may or may not know, program director, essentially you're responsible for what gets played. Right. You're responsible for the playlists. Yeah, I always say it's everything that comes out of the speakers. OK, so to me. I think a 24 year old is I, I want to know why both of you guys feel they wouldn't give a 24 year old a shot, because I feel a 24 year old would be perfect for that job, because one of the biggest beefs I have with radio is the fact that I did a poll. This is a couple of this is years ago because I've been on this soapbox for a minute. Right. I did a poll years ago on my little Instagram people. And this is back when I had like a thousand followers. I polled 100 people. And 72 of them, I wrote the numbers down in case I forgot because I went back and found it. 72 of them disliked the repetitive nature of radio. Five of them were indifferent. 23, they just didn't respond. Now, that's a small little, tiny little thing. But I know for a fact, millions of people feel that way. Like they can't stand the repetitive nature of radio now. And my question is, one, the reason why I feel 24-year-old PD would work is they wouldn't want to do that. And I'm going to put want in quotes because I realize there's policies and procedures now that they have to follow. So my question to you is going to be, what, what is it with radio stations that obviously don't see the fact that a lot of people can't stand the fact that you're listening to the same song like every 45, 90 minutes and they're turning it off? Like what is working with radio that's keeping radio breathing? Because that part, the creative part, as far as I'm concerned, like has sucked and died. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I would say it sucked and died, but I but I think a couple things. One is, and and by the way, there's actually I have about a 23-year-old program director at a station I consult in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, but that but to get that person a job in LA, you know, today they would want a lot more experience. Mm -hmm. um, but back to your point. I think the ratings changed it all. And, and that is when I was starting to program in the 70s, you know, the ratings came out twice a year. They were for one month at a time, you know, 
There would be a survey in April and a survey in October. And, you know, they just called people up and said, what radio station you listen to? And so in that period, it was all about getting the most ears. Didn't matter how long they listened or not, as long as they said their favorite radio station was yours. That's what mattered. As time went on and companies changed, and at one point there were multiple companies, now there's really two companies. And, you know, when Arbitron, which is now Nielsen, when Arbitron went to a seven day diary and then expanded the survey for how long people could listen, we would play games. I mean, when I was in LA, we had what we called the rubber clock. And you didn't say that on the air. It was an off-air conversation. But you needed to have five minutes of listening in each quarter hour. And so radio stations would run commercials at 10, 20, 40, and 50. And we were having people write down when they listened. And we knew that nobody listened accurately. And so we would lie about the time on the air. We would actually say... You know, before it was 10 after, we would start saying, if it 08, we would say it's 10 after. And and you would try to get that five minutes in each of those quarter hours. And so you would fib about what time it was. The other thing is you'd go on the air and you'd say things like, hey, if you heard the radio today, it was Mix 107.5. You know, because we were trying to get people to write down our station. Yeah, I listen to the radio, it's Mix. And we played all these silly games that, by the way, may have had no impact. Nobody knew. Right. But, but today, the technology is so much bigger. In a market like Atlanta, where you gentlemen are, people carrying the people meter, it looks like a little pager. And, you know, so first off, you're dependent on who's going to carry one of these things because you look like a drug dealer. <laughs> and, and the second part of it is, <laughs> you know, are you carrying it all the time? Are you purposely listening to radio? And so what radio has done is try to take advantage of the ratings because that's how we generate revenue. And so it's not just about in a diary market listening, it's reported listening, getting people to think they listen longer or at least report the listening they did do. And in a people meter market, it's about hoping the sample is such that you're getting a good sample of people in the market and that they are coming back to your radio station regularly. What we've seen through the research of people who participate in the ratings is time spent listening is built by repeat tune in. And that's what leads to that repetition. Playing the same songs over and over again are actually causing people to listen more. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, because nobody's sitting down and it is a rare person who's listening for three hours straight. That's right. A rare person. And so if every time you hit a radio station, be it on your phone or on your radio or on a smart speaker, and you hear a song you like, the odds are they'll come back more often to hear music they like. We can actually see that in the ratings. And so set aside reality for a second, there's rating reality. And rating reality is playing those same songs over and over again, gets people to come back more often, that builds time spent listening. And I hear you. I see the research of people who will say, too much repetition, new music discovery is not very evident anymore. And you know, that's why they go to Spotify and other streaming services. Right. But when you say to those same people in a focus group, how many of you have ever participated in a survey for ratings, survey of listening? Maybe one hand goes up. Very right. Few of those people. And so, and so there's the conundrum, right? I was going to say, because that uh, automatically now the data you're getting is somewhat biased because you're only people who actually listen to radio carrying these people meters 
as opposed to people like myself where I don't mind listening to the radio, but I swear to you, when I turn it on, I'm like, my God, are we going to play another 2001 Britney record again? You know, and immediately I turn it off. But I don't get a people meter. Where's my people meter? <laughs> what are we? We're the forgotten few. <laughs> yes. And, and therein is the challenge. And by the way, the rating services, both of them do the best job they can. Sure. A lot of people don't answer you know, when do you answer a number on your phone that you don't know? Right. Yeah. And, sure. and so, you know, it's tough to get to people today. A lot of people are on a do not call list, although that's not as much of a deterrent as it once was. Uh, it's just it's tough to get to those folks. At some point, radio will figure out how to aggregate the number of people who are listening to a station on the air how many are listening to them on a phone? How many are mm. listening to them? Um, you know, how many are listening to them in another location? Those are the things that matter to a radio station to being able to aggregate all of those things. I want to share a couple of short stories to answer your question of one, why a 24 year old wouldn't get the job and why I didn't. And I want to ask you, Mike, if you're seeing this kind of permeate through the industry more and more. I had a conversation with a couple different program directors when I was up for my first PD gig, which I did not get because I was young. <clears throat> um, the response I got for why I did not get that is because one of experience. Two, my music philosophy leaned heavily into getting back to discovering music. And you mentioned about that not being a big thing anymore. I wanted to be the type of station that broke records again. I was never a big DJ, but all of my friends were. And we were always tapped into who the newest artists were, who was moving the club scene, whose music actually had a wave, but they did not have the major outlet in radio that we had. And that's what I wanted to get stations back to. And I was told by two different program directors who were older in age that that was too risky for the industry now. And what we're trying to do is maintain our jobs. These are the words that came out of their mouth. Whose mouth? I'm not saying these names. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, th those words were spoken. And the feeling I got was we're not trying to grow as an industry. We're, we're, we're going to let it die if we're not going to try to stay ahead of it. Because there's going to be something that's going to allow people to find and discover new talent. And if we aren't the reason, if we're going to continue to play, you know, our powers in that 45, 55 minute cycle and we're not fitting a new song somewhere in there for them to be introduced to what the next wave is, we're going to start losing people. So that's the first thing of, mm -hmm. of why I know there wasn't it's because the conversation was we're trying to maintain the status quo and you're going to come in here and try to blow stuff up, which I absolutely was going to attempt to do. I wonder if you're seeing now in the industry, because at that time, both of those program directors were between 45 and 50, they're obviously older now, and they're both still PDs. Are the old regime that still have the keys to the machine and that mindset that they have, are you seeing that become a detriment to our growth and development? And is it time to start looking at some younger blood to give the masses, the forgotten few, what they want to hear in that medium so they don't have to go to streaming. Is Geritol causing the problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but it, it's not just the age of the program directors who are there. I agree. It's, it's above them at the corporate level, the highest level, because again, the ratings are so very important. Um, I, that's it. Before you go on, just because sure. I'm I'm the one with the Geritol problem because I got to remember crap all the time, which I don't. So you're saying the rating is so very important, but so far I've heard you say a couple of things that seem to me that the ratings are man you almost manufactured, like they're not pure true ratings. And, and am I missing something? Am I half right? Like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're manufactured. Huh? I, I would say. You know, the ratings are based on a small sample. So a city the size of Atlanta, there might be 1,100 meters on the street. Mm -hmm. And those 1,100 people are going to present what the audience ratings look like for that market. And so what, what you have is, again, there's a conundrum there of 
Everybody in radio wants bigger sample sizes. But mathematically, and I'm not a genius on this, this is just what I've been told, to increase the validity, you've got to go like from 1,000 to 10,000. Right. It goes up incrementally otherwise and not enough. And so it costs money to increase that sample size. So those are challenges that I know the rating services are all dealing with. People want bigger sample size, but they don't want to pay for it. Somebody's got to pay for it. Set that aside for a second. The only thing radio needs to do to have more young programmers is to, in smaller markets, give younger people a chance so they can build their career and go up. So you can go from Macon, Georgia, to Birmingham, Alabama, to Atlanta. You know, give them that chance to do that. I see it and deal with it all the time when it comes to women program directors. There's only about 11% of the women in programming for the entire nation. And so it's a small number. And that number went from 12% last year to 11, sorry, 12% in 2021 to 11% in 2022. Um, and I'll talk to people who will say, well, there just aren't enough program, female program directors out there. But well, somebody needs to give them a chance. Now, going back to you wanting to blow up the radio station, <laughs> that's, never, that's never a good approach. <laughs> but I was young and hot-headed at the time, Mike. <laughs> yeah. That's how legends are made, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you, but if you can give younger people a chance and train them, and then let them color outside the lines a little bit. You got to learn how to color inside the lines first. Then you let Picasso graduate from connecting the dots to painting portraits. And, and I think people, I'm echoing what you're saying, that there needs to be some chances given. When I was at Cumulus, I used to sit there and say, in every one of our markets, and they had 94, 99 markets, at that time, in every one of our markets, there's at least one station that doesn't make money, that doesn't perform well. That's the one you could experiment with. That's the one you could play with. But it's it was difficult for me to get anybody to buy into that, you know, because they would rather do something that's been tried a thousand times than roll that dice and see what happens. Um, so it's that fear of being out there too far. If we were having a staff meeting right now, you were running our staff meeting and you said everything that you said, I would be that guy in the room who would hear everything you just said. And I'd be like, OK, you're saying that we need a bigger sample size, but who's going to pay for all the people meters? And I'm like, why does anyone need to pay for anything when we have this right here, when I can just hop on, and I'm sure this isn't the right software, so, but just for my example, hop on Google Analytics or whatever, and why don't I just go to the digital charts and see what the frick people are listening to? There's my sample size. I don't have to send out people meters. I have it right here at www.peoplemeter.com. You know what I mean? So I, and that's, 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 that's where I feel like radio is a dinosaur and punch holes, please. In what I just said, forgive the naivete of my partner, Mike. I like I said, <laughs> I'm on the consumer angle. I am not in radio, but this is what consumers are thinking. So, like the re the reason why we're not getting more, mu more the re what I'm hearing is the reason why we're not getting more new music discovery. It sounds like it's too risky, and we don't really know if that's what the people want because we have too small of a sample size. And if we want a larger sample size, we need more people meters, and that's expensive. And I'm saying, let's just hop on the freaking internet, see what the people are gravitating to, and play those records. Now, now that, shoot holes. That does, factor, that does factor into music choice now in mm -hmm. that, you know, for instance, one of the other things I do is write the hot AC diagnostic column for a magazine called Monday Morning Intel. And we look at streaming as well as research. So we have consumer research where we've actually taken people played hooks of songs to them. Do you like it? Don't like it? Familiar with it? Unfamiliar with it? And so on. 
But we also look at what's streaming, what songs are streaming the most, what are people listening to the most. Mm -hmm. And I do believe streaming analytics, you know, to your point, seeing where people are, what people are listening to on Spotify, Pandora, Amazon, and so on is, is important, but that moves very fast. They're on and off and fast. And so there has to be some, you know, some measure of art to artisan there, because if you just jump on David Guyot and BB Rexa when it starts streaming, and then you jump off of it, as soon as its streaming numbers drop, that's a matter of weeks sometime. Because mm-hmm. what's happened is people have downloaded the song and they're listening to it on their own. They listen to it on demand. And I want to come back to on demand in a second. So, so with radio, you know, I do think streaming is a good indicator when to get on a song and to be aware of what's out there because consumers find it. Radio still has significantly more listeners overall. And, you know, if you, if you were to look at Spotify in America, Pandora, Sirius XM, pick a channel, on and on, radio collectively just has a bigger audience still. All of those DSPs, which is what you call Spotify or whatever, mm-hmm. all of those delivery programs wish they had the footprint that radio has. Challenge for everybody is the consumer today is programming their own radio station. Right. And that's and that's where I go to the on demand. If I'm in the car, maybe I'll hit the radio and I'm there for a little while till a 12 minute commercial cluster comes on. And then I jump to something else or I go to my own auto car play and put my own music on. But the consumer today has a lot of choices and that's going to continue to grow. It should have been no surprise to anybody when people said, wow, Netflix lost a lot of people in the last six months. Well, you know why? There's more choices now. It was great when the pandemic first started and Netflix was the big dog. But now you have Hulu. You have all these different streaming services and the competition level has grown. And it's going to continue to grow for radio and everybody. I mean, it's, you know, they're all going to keep going down like this. And so it means that radio needs to improve its product. Big dogs need to be bigger and better so that there's somebody that rises above all of the others. That That's what you'll find. Does that make so sense? It, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And so it sounds like radio needs to find out how to st- a radio station needs to find out how to stick out from everyone else how to be unique and since history is cyclical what about and again shoot down this idea i'm talking from the outside in what if a radio station said i tell you what why don't we why don't we experiment where and they pick an hour and not i could not a peak hour but maybe pick an hour where we just introduce all this new music that we see people are streaming Let's introduce it to terrestrial radio, ter- terrestrial radio during that hour. Let's see what the numbers do during that hour. And then let's see if, if that hour every day or whatever, if it seems like everyone is clogging our station during this hour, we might be on to something. Like to me, that would be the type of test that I would bring up in the meeting to try because I do feel that there, sh- there can be a balance. It just seems like radio, yeah, they're looking at the streaming numbers, but then they're kind of like, okay, that's popular. That's good to know. Let's put it on the back of our brains. And then we do nothing with it. And I just feel like they're just leaving gold just on the table with that. Yeah, there are some people that do that. You will find a lot of radio stations play more music at night, more new music at night, and and expose new music overnight. The problem with that is the audiences are still small. I mean, you know, I just participated in a uh, webinar that the country radio broadcasters put together. And I just talked about the fact that you know, a song needs to be getting 150 spins before people even get familiar with it. Um, and you can't you can't get big enough familiarity overnight. It's good. I'm not saying don't play new music overnight. I think it, if that helps somebody get to some new music, great. But, you know, 
it's a way to trial it. There's just not a big enough audience there. Right. I mean, but my responsibility is like, not do it overnight. Do it midday. You know, be t- right before the drive. You, you can't know? mess up the money, Stone. <laughs> so, no. So, break that down. So, how does that mess up the money? Well, because if you don't have the ratings, again, how much a radio station can charge mm-hmm. is based on the ratings you drive. You know, and, and by the way, there are people who break the rules and do very well. You are both in Atlanta. So it probably doesn't feel like the Burt show at Q99.7 breaks the rules, but but it does. That show is very unique and different than a lot of radio shows in other cities. And it's a highly rated radio show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's a highly rated show. You look at, you know, B98.5, you look at the river. Those are two stations I know you guys are familiar with. They have great ratings and they're unique to Atlanta in what they do. Um, You know, I don't know that there's a station like the river anywhere else because it's not really a classic hit station. It's not really a classic rock station. It's not really a triple A station, but it's generally one, two or three in Atlanta. It's just a good music station. Yeah. Which is why they're winning. Yeah. It's a true hybrid of hybrids. (laughs) I am. I'm, I'm curious to know what you think, is happening to not just the programming from the side of, of music, but the content side and the content creator side. Because in this age of perpetual syndication and more and more live and local talent are losing their jobs and having to become salespeople because the bigger shows are taking over more markets, the live and local, I think, is the big. And that was the, that was the other part of my music philosophy, aside with introducing more music was to really lean into homegrown live and local content and talent. Because I like even me, I'm a transplant. I'm not from Atlanta. I mean, I, I lived here for a little bit when I was two, but I can't say I was born and raised here. I spent more than 90% of my time in the state of Florida. So even with me being on air here, I'm technically not a part of what they would say is the life's blood of the city of Atlanta, even though I spent a lot of time here. And in a lot of markets now, you don't have that anymore. Uh, you used to have your morning show hosts would would have grown up in that city. Remember the high schools, played sports there, had mm-hmm. friends there, knew about the, the hot fun spots, the movie spots. We don't have a lot of that left. And I think that that's been playing a big part in a lot of our market share moving over to streaming because we're not giving a lot of our... T- our, our consumers what we actually have the most to give is that live and local in your consultations are you talking to stations around the country about that and not just the small ones because it's easy to do that in you know market 150 market you know 200 but when you start getting into that top 100 those are the ones i think that kind of lay the groundwork for the smaller stations to follow are, are those conversations being had to, to lean more into building that talent i know you said giving people a shot and that's that's that, that's a part of it but, you know, when are we going to get that 19, 21, 25 year old morning show host again that's from the city, that knows the city in and out and that can drive ratings from a local perspective and not just give blanketed content? Yeah, it's a it is a challenge. And, and what you're suggesting is exactly what radio should be doing. I mean, when radio cannot play more music in an hour than what Spotify does on a subscription channel. And even if you do the free channel at Spotify, they have like two minutes of commercials an hour, maybe four minutes, but they don't run 12 minutes an hour. They don't run 18 minutes an hour. Mm. Radio can't play enough music. And so it has to be great talent who can also be local. And if you use a syndicated show, and a lot of people do have the Bird Show or Elvis Duran or you know, Bobby Bone show or, you know, Frank Ski show or, you know, Keith Sweat. I mean, if you're running a syndicated show, you need to figure out how you're going to drop in things that localize that show. Because part of the reason to still listen to the radio is to know what's going on in your community, to hear from somebody first about a school closing due to a news item or to hear there's going to be a Susan G. Komen run for the cure and a cancer event. You know, those things are the things that Pandora, Spotify, Sirius XM, Amazon can't do and are not going to do. 
And so, you know, I think you have to be localized, and I think you want entertaining personalities. Having said that, you just heard me say, if you have a syndicated show, I do believe syndicated programs can be number one in ratings in a market. But I think it requires someone to help localize that show, someone who's going to jump in with what's important to the community. Um, Radio's biggest asset is being community driven. You know, radio talent are all freaked out right now because of chat GPT. I was just about to go there, (laughs) sir. (laughs) And you have everyone talking about AI. And, um, you know, one of my peers is a woman named Valerie Geller who coaches talent. And Valerie, when everybody started freaking out over it, she posted on social media, if you're worried about AI taking your job, you're a lazy on-air talent. And I agree with her. What AI will do, and despite the fact that it doesn't sound that human yet, it will get there and will sound very human. And what AI can't do is talk about the dinner I had with my wife or share a story about my kids playing soccer and a three-year-old for the first time trying to pick dandelions instead of focusing on the game. Those things that are observational, those things that are personal life stories are not possible to be copied by AI without someone making something up and sharing it. And so the real true human connection becomes important for on-air talent, not just what you get out of a prep service and not just some story you saw on the internet, but sharing the emotion of crying as your kid walked out the door to school on the first day of kindergarten. Those are the things that AI is not going to do. And if anything, air talent should embrace AI, should use AI, but use it as a tool to help make their program better. You, wait, uh, wait, you, you, you wait one. You, I know you're excited, man. I keep Calm thinking down. y'all know each other, so I'm trying to get my time in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we get off of the A, because I think both of us are about to go the AI we direction. We are, we are. One of the things that's becoming more and more prevalent is that the way you would get into the industry back in the good old days is you'd get an overnight slot or a night slot or you get to come and produce traffic or something. Those opportunities aren't being given out anymore. Like I'm not we don't have any young college kids that do our overnight shifts. Uh, everything is fully automated now, which is a form of artificial intelligence. The, the system runs itself. We pre-program it, but we have rules in place that if then else. And that system can take care of everything from I think most stations will go off at. 10 ish, and then we come back at 6 a.m. for the most part. You've got some that'll, their last live talent will be at 7, and then you'll get the morning show at, at 6 a.m. The opportunities for these new talents to get in this industry are, are starting to dwindle. And the reason why I bring that up is I've, I've had the privilege of working in four different areas of the entertainment industry. And I can confidently say that radio has easily become the most difficult one to get into, even above becoming an actor, because the jobs are so few and far in between. And now that you have something like artificial intelligence that can write the content that will eventually be able to sound humanized, what do you see the future of opportunities for that next generation of jock to get a shot at being a talent? Because I don't have an answer for these kids when they ask me now. I don't know what to tell them. Well, there's, there's more opportunities today, actually, than there used to be. It is true that we no longer have the farm team of the overnight person, the weekend person, although there are some companies like, you know, the one you work at that is mainly live uh, air talent, but, but that's in the minority. Most companies today are doing something other than having live talent on a weekend, nights or overnight. And so when I say I think there are more opportunities today, I'm talking about like what we're doing right now, a podcast. There is uh, an app for a program that Amazon has called AMP, A-M-P. If you don't have AMP, download the app. But it allows people to be their own DJ, play music, and put on a show. 
Now, the reason you can't really do it yourself is you would have to play, pay, you know, for the music clearance rights. But because Amazon owns this app, the music's already there. And so Amazon's approach to it is all these hobbyists doing their own radio show. And if somebody starts getting an audience, Amazon will pay them, AMP will pay them for that audience so they can put an advertisement or two in there. And so AMP is one thing. Clubhouse is another where you can practice. Um, look at all of those things like podcasting, like AMP, like Clubhouse. Look at creating your own online radio station. I mean, all of those things are ways to improve your skills. If you're good at social media and you can do TikTok, I can point to people who have been hired from their social media presence who now have a radio show. And so think about all of those options. The trick, Johnny, is getting paid for it that you can live on. That's right. The thing. right. And, and so... If you can start out and get someone's attention, it's the same as starting in a small market and then getting picked up for another market. You um you wrote an article or had an article come out, I think it was a few days ago, where you were talking about radio GPT. Yes. Yeah. All right. So kind of going, staying on the AI thing a little bit. Now, I know we talk about the human element, you know, and for a minute there, I I was a thousand percent AI will never replace the human element and da 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 da. It's spiritless and soulless and whoop de whoop de woo. It took and two then, weeks to change his mind. And then I see a ray a, a, a robot putting in eyelash extensions, which is a job I thought will always be human. <laughs> and now I'm second guessing some things. So let's get let's say now I don't know if this is how radio G GPT works, but let's say you have AI come in. They're the on-air personality. They're programming what to say. And in the background, it's looking up data. Okay, this song was hot this week over here. This song was hot this week. I'm going to play this. And then it's doing social media searches. Oh, this guy always oh, a great story about this guy who went out and got dumped by his girlfriend. And then it throws that story on. And I mean, if it's programmed correctly, it, it's, it's a very real threat. And now we have where AI is programmed. It puts the data out. It then reads its own data and creates new query and then programs itself and then does that loop. So it is constantly getting better. I mean, if we're, When we're looking at that, do we still feel that radio is safe from eradicating the human element? Well, there would definitely be someone who will eliminate jobs, mm -hmm. um, you know. And it's the same person who's, you know, added voice tracking or put on a syndicated show. There will be someone who will eliminate jobs. I, I view it a little bit different. There's two things there. Yeah. Some of the AI programs, like Radio GPT, had, they have another product called Topic Pulse, which aggregates everything that's trending from social media, everything that's being talked about in your community. So it automatically takes that and the AI voice can deliver that information in a break. So it mm -hmm. sounds like a human who just found something online is talking about it. Yeah. And there's probably another one or two programs out there like that, although I'm unfamiliar with them. Most of them are text to talk, which means someone's got to sit there and type it out. And so that's a big headache because think about how much time it would take you to do all that. Right. Uh, but but when I drive across America and I pop on radio stations and I listen from seven to midnight and overnight, it's not happening in Atlanta because you're a big market where every minute's worth a lot of money. But there's a lot of small towns in America that have no disc jockeys on the air at all. There's nothing but music playing and you're a jingle or you're a sweeper between two songs. Sweeper is a little identifier. And that's it. There's no personality. If Radio GPT adds personality to that, then that's great. Now we've got content. And if it's set up properly, it can create 
a system where a disaster is called out, a tornado is called out, a hurricane is called out. All of those things are identified and presented. But, you know, that was one of the big problems a dozen years ago, that there was a train derailment somewhere in Idaho or Montana, and the local radio station had nobody in it. It was on automation. And so there was no way for them to evacuate a city. Wow. And so if AI solves for that, then that's a service to the community. Sure, that's sure. an upgrade. I'm a, I got one more Go ahead, that bro. I want to ask. That's it. So this, this one, this question is for the people, <laughs> for the artists specifically. In no uncertain terms, no holds barred, real and raw, all right, for your artists out there, because right now I do believe that radio still is the number one way to get exposure as an artist, right? What does it literally take, both from your past experiences, your vast knowledge and experience, to even where music is now, whatever, full disclosure, all right? What does it literally take for an artist to get their song on radio? So the internet is a good discovery source still, but it does take radio to make it a hit. You know, the DSPs, the streaming services, can introduce a song, but it takes over the air radio. Be And I say over the air, you might be listening to it on phone or smart speaker on your computer, but you know what I mean by that. It takes radio to still make it a hit. And... When you say, what's it take for a song to become a hit today? There, there are some exceptions like Gale at ABCDEFU. And so a song like that, you know, got so much talk and social media and streaming made so much noise about it that a record label signed the artist and they took it to radio. But that's the rarity. You really almost need to have a major label or one of the larger independent labels to get a hit today. Now, that independent label can get the song so far, and then they may do a deal with a major, or they may sell the song and the artist with that project to a major. But you need ultimately that big, big footprint. I'm going to tell you something. It's crazy. This is my own editorial commenter here right now. Absolutely. <laughs> In the earlier days, there was something called payola. And I've never taken payola in my life. I think payola has always been a bad thing. Me either. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, Does it still occur? I, I think it, it occurs, but now it's like corporate. Yeah, it's, it's different. Right. It's, it's yeah. evolved into something else. It's not monetary. It's more like favors type of thing. Or yeah, it's. In the original thing, where when air talent controlled the songs that were played, or when a program director could just add anything they wanted, a label might get to a PD or a talent and say, hey, man, I'll, g- I'll give you and your wife a trip to France. Right. You know, because I love you, quote unquote. Right. And somebody would play a song. Today, that shifted to corporately where... You know, a label, actually, let me back up before where it is today. Let's go back 12 years, 15 years. And and a label would go to a record, uh, to a radio group and say, we'll give you a promotion with Elton John. You can fly 20 listeners from all your different markets to see Elton John in London and his performance at Wimbledon. And, and, you know, radio stations go, okay, we'll do that. And that was a form of payola. Right. Then the New York Attorney General jumped in. They shut all that down. And so now a label might go to a company, a corporate, and say, hey, we'll give you this trip for two to see Elton John in London. The radio group will say, yes, we'll do that. But they're not necessarily going to add or play a song in exchange for it. They're going to promote it and market it so that the audience becomes aware of the song so that they can buy it, downloading it, get the single, get that one song online, or to increase ticket sales for Elton John. So now, so now it's legal. And the radio station, by the way, has to say 
his promotional time was paid for by Republic Records or whoever the label is. What I was going to say that is controversial is, and I was able to meet Elliot Spitzer, the attorney general from New York, who changed this. And I said to him, I know that what you were doing was trying to keep small artists from having to pay for airplay. But what you actually did was decrease the opportunity for those artists. Because at least when there was that type of payola, their song got played. It got on the radio. Right. And and now they don't have that exposure on the radio. So mm-hmm. they can't get that exposure online. And by the way, please don't anybody send me an email going, I can't believe you supported payola. I don't support payola. My point was that at least songs got played that would never have seen airplay otherwise. Now, you know, you have to look to the DSPs or getting on TikTok or somewhere to make a hit. All right. Fancy, fancy like that, a country song that eventually crossed, that song started on TikTok as an independent song. Ultimately, that artist got signed to a label. But those are few and far between. It's tough for somebody to get a song started. And, and if your question was uh, the belief that you can buy your way onto radio now, you can. Right. You can. Right. I would like to know what's happening with the relationship between the radio stations and the artists. That time period that I came in in 08, 09, I met Rita Ora that year. Uh, Shine Down was one of the first groups that I ever got a chance to actually mix in studio and interview. It used to be very common for radio stations to do unplugs. You'd, you'd bring a group of listeners in to a private concert mm-hmm. with, you know, a popular up and coming artist or even ma- a major artist that's that's coming back on tour. I have seen the numbers of those types of performances decrease almost 90 percent just in the last Five years. Now, I will say the pandemic probably had a lot to do with it. But even prior to that, before I left V103, we only did two that very last year before I left and went to to iHeart. And it was I believe it was Jamie Foxx came through and I think we did a private session with Neo. But after that, I I don't I don't see a promotion on, on radio station sites about it anymore. I don't see the artists being as interested in building those relationships with radio anymore. In your consultations, do you see a, a diminishing interest in that relationship from the artist and the radio side to continue to build and bridge that to provide one of those, you know, once in a lifetime experiences for a small group of listeners that can be your mouthpiece in the street that help with the whole PPM system that, you know, you never know who's got it. But when someone who they know got to experience that, they're talking about it, that buzz starts to build. What's happening with with those relationships and why do we see that going away? Because I also feel that that's a big part of what brought the X Factor entertainment element to radio, because with it being the whole theater of the mind, you can only hear us when you got that opportunity to be in the presence of not only your favorite air talent or the air talent that you listen to weekly, but some of your favorite artists. It it changed the dynamic of the relationship that the listener and the radio station have with one another. Yeah, I think that. You are correct to say it's greatly diminished. It was accelerated by the pandemic. It was already going down like this. Then the pandemic hit, and it was an excuse for people to be on Zooms and use video and not have to be there in person and pull in a lot of different people from a radio station. Country music is still there. Um, I, I tell the story about when I was at Cumulus Westwood One, we used to do Radio Row and Red Carpet broadcast around the Billboard Music Awards, uh, the American Music Awards, the ACM, BET, those different awards. And, you know, if, if, and we would set up and have like what we called the fan zone. So you'd have where the limos are going to pull in and fans would all be clamoring. We would put this woman who was a former uh, Miss America runner up in the group with a microphone. And she would coax the artist over and talk to them. Well, if Usher got out of the car and waved over the top of the car at you, that was a big deal. Keith Urban and Nicole Kidman would get out of the car and walk over and pose and do selfies and get interviewed. Country radio artists 
still spend time visiting radio stations, still spend time playing acoustic sets in conference rooms with pizza and a dozen winners. But the other artists don't do that. I think a part of it is that, you know, country is still a niche format. It's not as big financially for most of the artists, not all of them. Some of them are big, big, big money. But for most of them, they're not at the level of, you know, pick Rihanna or almost any artist. And those artists also have a certain allure and a certain approach of being inaccessible. If they're not very accessible, when you have a chance to go see them in concert, you go. And so it's just a different marketing approach. Right. Uh, but but country still does it. I mean, country artists are still there. You can go to the country radio seminar, and there'll be 20 different artists who are multi-million sellers walking around. And they might have one person with them as a handler. <laughs> Until they start doing drill country, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is actually happening. There are some, yeah, there's some drill country samples that are going around. Does that does that mean that country is the blueprint for how we? I'm not gonna say get back to the good old days of radio, which is how I kind of started this conversation. Thank you for shooting that down as eloquently and softly as you did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but is is country giving us the blueprint of of how we as a medium survive what's happening? Because I don't. I mean, it's not over with. AI is going to continue to exponentially grow. There's going to be a, a lot more consolidation, as we talked about earlier, and it's. When that happens, you, you're starting to see stations get swallowed up now. Uh, my station was sold a couple years ago, uh, which was a huge surprise to all of us. But given how, how big CMG actually is, more of that is coming. But in that, do you survive by doing it the way country is, is, is doing it, even with how they're programming their music? Yeah, I think, as, I think as an artist, you still want, here's why you want to go to iHeart or Odyssey or Cumulus or Cox, or Town Square, or Hubbard, or Alpha, is because you if you can get a group ad, suddenly you're on 40, 50, 60 radio stations. Um, and so you still want to go to those big places, but most of those companies, not all of them, but most of those companies still allow a, allow a program director, if they're excited about a song or an artist, to get behind it a little bit earlier. You know, not crazy, but a little earlier. Mm -hmm. I was head of programming at Cumulus. We would send out a safe list and say, here's this week's recommended playlist. But we would also always say, hey, if there's something you think will work in your market, don't be afraid. Feel free to roll the dice. Now, if I saw some song pop up on one of our station playlists, that I had no idea what it was, I wouldn't call in and say, what are you doing? But I would say to the VP of that format, hey, call this guy in Dallas and ask him what he's seeing. Is this a song we should all be looking at? You know, what's going on there with that song? Here's the bad news with what we did. That's the good news. The bad news is there are some program directors who are just afraid to take a chance. And it didn't matter how much I would say, if there's something you believe in, roll the dice and go. But we've created a world of genocide where some of the most daring out there, creative programmers, were eliminated, driven out of the business, or just beaten up so badly that they're afraid to roll the dice. And so what we inadvertently have done is create an environment where it's better to do nothing than do something and get in trouble. And that's, yeah. a shame. that's a shame. That was never the intention, but it's where we've ended up. I've, I've got, I've got one the more. The downfall of society yeah. in general. That, that setup leads me to something that I would be remiss if I did not do, given that this is my platform and I have you here. So I can ask you this question. <laughs> As someone who's been an air talent and a producer for the past 15 years, my, my ultimate goal was to become a program director in a large cluster. 
it's looking more and more like that's not something that I even want to do, let alone that it's possible because the people who have those jobs are in that mid age to where before they leave or I get a shot, I'll be in my 50s or 60s and that's just not something to do. So as, as a mid career media personality, what do you suggest as a consultant I start looking at as other options aside from wanting to be a brand director or a program director of a cluster, but still be in the industry to where I can still affect some change and, and kind of guide the direction of what the next generation of what radio is going to be? When you answer that, Mike, please understand that the dire consequence is him being on the corner somewhere. <laughs> doing what he's got to do. So please mentor this young man right now in this moment. Hey, there is, there's nothing wrong with selling pencils on a street corner. There it is. I'm not, we're going to, that would be bottled water. <laughs> right. Well, actually I think that's I illegal know. now. I don't yeah, think the, Atlanta, that the Atlanta water boys ruined that. Yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. They, they messed that up for yeah, everybody. They messed that up for everybody. <laughs> I used to like that, man. Um, so, so let me see this. You know, you've been an assistant program director before. Being an assistant program director should should be the path to become program director. And, you know, a model that I've used in the past is to say, okay, if we name this person assistant program director, then we should allow them to coach the voices that we use on the weekend. Even if they're voice track, the assistant program director can have training wheels by coaching the talent who are on the air on the weekend. That's a benefit. The other things I would have them do is learn how to schedule music, if it's a music radio station, so that they can then fill in and do that for me when I'm on vacation as PD. I would also want them to work with the promotion team to write promos, to write liners, to do all of those things that incorporates skills you will need as a program director. And so that's one of the things I would say to do. And in your particular case, if you want a programming job, you are in a larger company. I would not believe that a PD in every position is there for life. You know the saying, stuff happens. And if this weren't a polite podcast, it's the actual word. But so, the, you know, things change. The one thing you can be sure of is nothing's for sure. And so I would make the powers that be aware that you want to advance. And that goes for anybody who's listening to this. Often, someone who is in a leadership role is unaware of who wants to advance the career. And if they're silent, then there's an assumption made, yeah, they're happy doing what they're doing. They don't want to move. They have kids. They can't move. Well, you know what? I moved Wheeling, Charleston, Louisville, San Diego, L.A., Cleveland. People move. Kids are resilient. Life happens. And so make the people you report to aware that you want to advance and you're open to relocating or anything else that it takes to do. When I started my career, I said, I don't know where my career will go. And by the way, I exceeded my wildest expectations years ago. But I said, I don't know where my career will go, but I'm going to follow wherever it takes me. Mm. And so if you are determined that this will be your life career, then you, then you got to be prepared to do anything to make it. That was a gem, sir. I think we're going to end on that one. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I must do now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Mike, thanks so much for being here. I, I learned a lot. And thank you for setting me free with these answers to these questions. I'm, and I mean, actually, very sincerely, I've been wanting to ask those questions for years to someone who would give it to me, you know, straight between the eyes. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, how can people stay in touch with you and follow you and, and what you're doing with, with uh, McVeigh Media and things like that? Yeah, on Twitter, it's Mike McVeigh. Uh, Instagram, Mike McVeigh. Facebook, Mike McVeigh. Um, you know, reach out to me on any of those. LinkedIn is also Mike McVeigh. You really should try to keep it simple, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and my, uh, 
My email address is Mike McVeigh at McVeigh Media. So that's M I K E M C V like victory A Y. Mike McVeigh at McVeigh Media. Um, and so dot com, of course. So feel free to email me or instant message me on any of those platforms. Awesome. Thanks so much. Last you- question before we get out of here, and I'll tell you where to find me. Uh, draft grade of your Pittsburgh Steelers. How do you feel about how y'all did last week? Spectacular. Ooh, okay. Um, okay. They did fabulous. And, mm-hmm. and you know, I was worried because it's a, this is a first year, first time general manager. Um, the Steelers had the family, the Rooney family for a lot of years. Then they changed managers and we did okay. But I think this guy did really good. And I love seeing Joey Porter's son join the Steelers. Oh, yeah. You know, we've got three groups of brothers on there now as well. Um, you know, and while a lot of people are taking shots at our quarterback, I think this kid's pretty good. He's not going to be Deshaun Watson. He's or not Jalen Hurts. Be, say it again. Or Jalen Hurts. Yeah, he's not going to be Jalen Hurts. He's not going to. I don't know that he can scramble or or make up plays the way all these other guys can, but he can scramble when he thinks he's going to be killed, and um, <laughs> and he's very accurate as a passer. So we'll see. We'll see. He's probably the worst of the four quarterbacks in our division, but I think the Steelers every year have a chance to make the playoffs. And Mike Tomlin, man, oh yeah, man, that that's that's you know we talked early on about women. There should be more people of color as head coaches in the NFL. And Mike Tomlin is a leader in that regard. He is a strong man who walks the walk. Yeah, he sets the bar for sure. Well, I will keep a lookout for Yeah, you the, gave me a reason to watch the Steelers the games. The famous, well, you got to watch out for his socks too, his famous lucky uh, Steelers socks that he puts exactly. on. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me at Just Johnny Vaughn, J-U-S-T-J-O-N-Y-V-A-N, all over the place. No dot com yet. That's there. <laughs> oh God! And as always, um, I'm Stone Stafford, S T A F F O R D, StoneStafford.com. Everything about me, and of course, if you want to come to our hub for Life on Podcast, that is easily LifeOnPodcast.com. We appreciate you guys. Thanks for your love. Thanks for uh, liking and subscribing and telling a friend. Uh, we need to do a love shout out today. So our love shout out podcast today is going to be the Shrimp Tank podcast that yeah. is shrimp tank podcast.com you got to go, go in there and follow and listen to my man lee heisman and ted jenkin these are two super successful business owners and entrepreneurs they give you i mean it's like going to entrepreneurial school 101 so check out shrimp tank podcast.com and as always we're out until we see y'all next week one million subscribers in, in 2023, 2023. mr mike mcveigh thank you so much again thank you so much mike mcveigh Thank you, gentlemen. All right, we're out of here. We love y'all. Peace. So back to what I was saying. What I was saying.